that darn Cardi Jew. They're making us ravenous look horrible. Shalom and welcome to another exciting edition of Torah Watchman Show LLC. You're none other than your humble host here, your favorite Karate Jew, yes, in the greater minority of Maryland, United States of America. My, as far as I know, my only, my family is the only family who has transitioned from traditional orthodoxy to Karateism because I believe this is absolute Torah truth. I really do. Anyway. The title of this Torah Watchman Show edition is Parashat Hazinu, and I'm going to give you an Aliyah summary. I'm going to give you a breakout in seven sections of Sidras. I hope everyone's been well. I've missed you. I really have. There's a lot going on in the minds and hearts of Jews all over the world. Can you say about Rosh Hashanah? Can you say the 10 days of all? Can you say Yom Kippurim? That's what's happening. At least if you're considered to be an observant Jew, and there's not too many of those in America. They're really not, unfortunately. And I, I, I do give uh, kudos to my orthodoxy brethren, and they are my brethren. Even though I, I, it appears I give them a hard time, bad rap, it's simply because I've dealt with them, I've been embedded with them for nearly a decade, and I've seen everything about, about them that I that is not... Um, reference back to the Torah as far as behavior, halakha, and, and, you know, legalism and things of that nature. But they do, they are observant. And, and in other words, when we come together, we don't debate the existence of Jehovah God. We have different names for Jehovah God, like Hashem, uh, Adonai, um, other names, Habad and Kabbalah. Kabbalists actually have 72 different numerology names and editions of God's holy name and I essentially you know I go by the Torah and it says very clearly you are to know me as the as the as the holy God of Abraham Isaac and Yaakov you are to know me in his sacred name I will be that I will be that is revealed to Moshe and the um, burning bush which which scholars today have concluded in the Masoretic text incidentally Karate's were the authors of most of this Karate text, and they did a very difficult job of translating it as far as the vowels I'm concerned. When you say Maserati text, you're thinking about vowels, little dots and little little hyphens and other things of that nature to indicate there is a pause or something in the way you pronounce a word, because natively Hebrew is all consonants. It's all consonants. And uh, these are like helper tools per se on how to pronounce a proper word, not germane. But Jehovah is a very, it's probably, I would say, 98% as close as it can be to the name that was, uh, that was functionally used among the ancient Israelites in the day of Moshe and, and Yahshua and Ibn Amon by Ruth, who declared her love for Jehovah, who was the God, the, the uh, you know, Asher, Jehovah, el of Naomi. And they were not afraid to say that holy name, but some reason today, most of orthodoxy, unless it's Yom Kippur, and even they hyphenate it. Is, I, I've read the Matzars and everything, the, per, the prayer books, the structured prayer books for the high holidays. A lot of good information there. But um, we only say the holy name in orthodoxy once a year. And, you know, Jehovah, the divine creator of the God of all heaven, is that Yaakov, how he's referenced in the Torah at large, you know, he wants to be our father. He wants, he wants us to be his children. And that's where I'm going with this parashat here, Hazino. You can turn with me to Deuteronomy or Davarim, chapter 32, verses 1 through 52. This is a relatively short uh, Torah parashat, and you will find it in this Torah cycle, in the week leading up to Yom Kippur, unless it's on a leap year. A leap year, I'm sorry. So the word um, hazino literally means to listen to, and the reference point is shamayim of the heavens. This is how Moshe opens up this poetic set of verses, roughly, I would say, 48, 49 different verses. Now, I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Um, it was designed by Jehovah God 
or Meshach to be sung. And I like the Song of the Sea and Merah. Well, this, this, group, this Sidra, this group of passages and verses here are meant to be sung. So therefore, it's in poetry. And when you have poetry, you have I'm a pentameter and all this stuff. You remember from high school? You know, most, most poems rhyme. Not all poems rhyme, though. But it reminds me a lot of uh, Isaiah, you know, in uh, chapter one, as far as his admonishments and everything else. But let me get to the main point here. Remember, when you say Hazino, you're talking about the operative uh, uh, article here, like the, you know, Ha is always the. We say the Azino from the heavens, that God is speaking to you from the heavens. You look up and you see the luminaries. It's just like you read Bereshit. You talk about the luminaries, the sun of the day, uh, the moon at night, the stars, the planets, all the astrological constellation signs, the zodiac and all this. God is self-evident everywhere in the universe he created and all the portals and and access points to creation that we can see him and know he's real. So, um, a general overview again. This is a prayer, probably in the last part of uh, Moshe's day, the final day of his life, his birthday, incidentally, right before he was finally called up to Mount Nebo, and where his body would be be uh, specially prepared, and we can read about this in the next parashat, for Elohim who would bury him, up that mountain. Um, so th just think about it. You know, last pair of shot, figuratively speaking, was the first part of the day. And then uh, this pair of shot is the, is the final part of the day. And then th think about the sun as, as getting close to horizon, close to the, um, you know, yeah, to the horizon in the west as beginning to, to sink. And you think about the end of the day and you think about the end of Moshe's life. Well, this sad, but everything has has to come to an end, right? So in the first aliyah, again, behold the heavens before the whole shamayim, before all the creation, all the fixtures of the world, all the in, infrastructural uh, um, um, parts and 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 the quantum physics and all the laws of, of physics and everything else of nature that keeps keeps our Earth from flying away from the sun and gravity and everything. And, the nuclear force, the sun, all these things, Jehovah is in, is, is evidence of Jehovah is in all these things at play. So Moshe declares, um, it, it, is li it is life in the world when you see the dynamic changing of the seasons, you, when you see the change of day to night, these operative changes or direct evidence of a divine creator's intent in your life. That he is in control, we may think we're in control in a microcosm, but evidently, but you know, in reality, it's Jehovah that, that controls the four winds of the planet, right? So whether or not we have rain and due seasons, you know, you don't want rain continually in the summer because um, the grain, the wheat will, will rot on the shaft. Uh, and, and, and you want just enough rain to be able for the seeds to germinate, right? Um, I grew up in the South, and we uh, cut uh, grass, grassy fields, pastures for cows called hay and dried it out. And sometimes you had an afternoon rain, and if, if that rain did not, if that hay did not cure properly, it could rot and mold and make the, make the cattle sick. Well, these things here that God in control of these elements, and that's all I saw it pointed out. So in other words, if you are harvesting uh, your crops normally in the regular season, you get the regular rains, <clears throat> you have a good profits going to market, and pro you're making a good profit, and you're taking care of your family. And very importantly, you have enough to go around to feed the Kohen Gadol, the Levitical priesthood, and your tenth, uh, tenth of your tithe before the Lord. Uh, and also enough uh, set aside for charity for the homeless. So if you have all this abundance and your silos are full, then you must be doing something right. This is what uh, Moshe was trying to say. And even in our prayers today, in every uh, every Jewish prayer, Shakri, um, uh, the Menka, Avrit prayers, uh, 
the three prayers or two prayers, you know, Cardi t prays twice a day with her Shema and other things with that. Orthodoxy pray three times in their liturgy. Um, but in every prayer, there's a blessing there. In the summer months, leading up to the cult, you thank God for the dew, right? You thank God for the dew. The dew is very nourishing to tend to plants and things in the morning. Sometimes you have a heavy dew, and when you, it may be a little bit dry, but that helps to cross, right? And that's evidence that Jehovah is there in your life, blessing you and not being cursed. So just look up. You know, so many people just don't look up, okay? But we need to have a thankful attitude and not thankless attitude. We take things for granted, right? Oh, I have a, I had a bumper crop this year. Look at my ingenuity. Look at my salesmanship. Look, I, I took my cows and cattle and, and goats to auction and I made a lot of money this time. Did you give credit at all to the giver of all good things? That's what uh, Michelle is talking about. Talking about what he dealt with the debt systemically with a stubborn, <coughs> uh, stiff-necked Jewish people, the Hebrews there in this time, was their uh, thankless attitude. You know, whether you have manna, you have quail, and, and you have Miriam's well and other things like this, they're always complaining and whining about something. And this is what Moshe is warning them in this song, in this parody per se, okay? On uh, the second day, Aliyah, Moshe besieges the Israelites to, to, to uh, contemplate their entire history holistically, look all the way back where they came from in Goshen, Egypt, Look how God guided them uh, along the path, like, like a mother bird taking care of its, its brood, its young, like an eagle, a very territorial, very predator, and it will, do, it will fight to the death to protect its nest. This is how Jehovah has demonstrated himself and, and the migration uh, and the, and, uh, of the Hebrew people going through the desert, the wilderness of, of sin, uh, the Mount, Mount Sinai Peninsula, the valley in that area, you know, you talk about Median and everything else, you know, all these areas here were the elements were very much against you, you know, the uh, scorpion and the serpent were your neighbors. That's not good neighbors, but you know, when your hope of God is there, even your shoes don't wear out as often, and you don't have the same diseases as the Malachites, right? And this is what Moshe was trying to drive home. Humility and thankfulness, okay? Um, <clears throat> he, he chose, um, Jehovah said he chose to spare the, the Israelite people despite their sin. Uh, you remember the golden calf? You remember the Korak of rebellion? And other incidents like this when they refused to go in the land of, uh, of Canaan and conquer it when that time, and they had spread out propaganda about um, Joshua and Caleb, about their positive report versus their negative report. This is what Moshe was talking about. That's why an entire generation of people over 40 years wandering died in the desert, okay? So um, God enveloped them in his loving arms, like I said, in eagles, outstretched arms over the brood and took care of them, kept, kept uh the uh, young chicks warm per se in the cold desert you know he had fire there above the tents of israel there to keep them warm he took care of them with clouds in the in the daytime to help minimize uv exposure sunburn and all the other elements there it's just you know it's so much evidence that uh Jehovah is there for those people and then their generations told the stories on how God pulled them out of a rut and pulled them out of a ditch and pulled them away from their enemies and defeated their enemies. Now God is hidden from our midst today. And we still, whether God hides himself or he's there in the miracles and everything else before us and all the Kabbalistic mysteries of what constitutes a, a divine creator, we still are thankless, right? We still are thankless. And that's just part of being human, right? Unfortunately. Uh, also, God, God um, alone guided them. No government entity, no social welfare program, no food stamps, no security blanket. It was only Jehovah God. 
Uh, it was not because the Malachites were good to them. It's not because uh, the Ammonites were good to them. On the contrary, they were very evil to the Jewish people. Um, in the third Aliyah, Moshe then speaks of the Israelites' future, looking forward in the future in a prophetic kind of tone here, just like uh, uh, um, Isaiah, you know, Isaiah. Um, so when he was looking in the future, he, he told them, he said, this is what to expect in the future. Uh, you're, you're going to have the choices of produce. You're going you're gonna, to uh, take the land away from the evil Canaanites that were letting the land go to ruin, and it was all about their own ego. They think about the Tower of Babel and that kind of thing. The egotistical people built the great cities and did not give any glory to the God of the heavens, okay? The God of Shamaim. So what uh, Jehovah is trying to say is, is that you go into a perfect land, and then you gradually stray away from the God that made it perfect. I mean, the land of Israel is not the most fertile uh, soil on the, on, on the planet. Indonesia, created by volcanoes, is much more fertile uh, than the land than Eretz Israel, and you don't have to work so hard to plant uh, coffee or tea or whatever you want to plant there. But everything has to be right. The, the soil chemistry, the rains, the right amount of sunlight and temperature variances and all this has to be just right uh, to be able to grow anything in Israel. The miracle there, and why Jehovah made the land of Israel so hard to grow anything, because he wanted the Jewish people to turn to him in their prayers. And it's that simple. The fourth Aliyah, God became uh, incensed by his children's behavior. Their behavior was abominable. And many times Jehovah uh, told Moshe, get away from me. The stiff-necked people, I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm going to destroy them. It, it, you know, it was so many times that Jehovah God had a complete righteous indignation to destroy Israel because they broke the covenant. You know, the Jewish people, the reason why we've been um, uh, exiled and, and the Holocaust and, and uh, tortured and, and just miserable circumstances, you know, and different empires rise and fall and why we're subjected to all those things is because we knew better. We had the knowledge of the Torah in us versus the ignorant Gentiles. You know, Jehovah will judge less the Noahites that know less about the Torah than the Jewish people that were raised with the Torah when they're young children. He will judge those people. Why? It's the same reason why Jehovah told Moshe that you, you um, embarrass me uh, among the people of Israel. You embarrass the image of me before the children of Israel when you lost your temper with that rock, okay? You know, struck the rock, uh, struck the rock with his staff instead of calling upon it to produce water. It, this is the same thing I'm talking about here. It's absolute trust in God's providence over your life. So the behavior and everything else, negative behavior, is like a contagion, it's like can something cancerous. Uh, infectious disease, COVID, where you want to come up with your mind for examples here, it spreads and, other, and you blend in with other people and you make justifications and compromises, interfaith marriage, etc., etc. One thing led to another, the slippery uh, slope argument there. Where is the uh, path for Teshuva? And Jehovah said he could have utterly destroyed the nation of Israel. And he could have started over Moshe over again. He could have done. Because we're dealing with a miracle worker. We really are. And it's amazing that I'm alive today to talk about this. It's amazing that any Jews alive after the Holocaust. And after all the intent of the, of the Gentile nation to destroy the Jewish people. We're still here. On this Carl High, right? Uh, the fifth Aliyah. If the nations were wise, they would have understood that no nation could experience such a devastation unless God had completely abandoned them and delivered them to their enemies. There's a lot of Christians love to throw up Isaiah 53 in a Jewish face. They say, oh, you don't read that. You're forbidden to read Isaiah 53. Well, Isaiah 3, 53 actually begins in Isaiah 52, I think around verse 12, I'm not sure. Uh, these are artificial things, you know, chapters in, in, in the Jewish Bible were done by a bishop not germane, but I'm just saying here is that 
the rise and fall of the Jewish people as a witness among the Gentile nations, they see, they say by all evidence, by all evidence, by all uh, statistical predictions and probability curves and everything else, the Jewish people should not exist today because of their sin, because of the abominations of the past, because of the way we treated each other. You know, sometimes we treat each other worse than we treat Gentiles that we curse. Just think about that. And I'm not exaggerating either, okay? Uh, <clears throat> how can one enemy pursue a thousand of Israel and, 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 and two put 10,000 to flight? How can this happen? You think about in the days of King Hezekiah, the armies of Assyria were immense. I mean, uh, the, the number is like 200,000, 300,000 chariots and troops. The, uh, the chariots of Egypt, their military might and prowess was much greater than the Jewish people who were shepherds. And, but, you know, God defeated the Assyrian army on, on Passover in the days of King Hezekiah. He saved the day for Judea during that time. So the nations are at witness for the rise and fall of the Jewish people based on their acceptance of the Torah, based on them not lying, based on them keeping their covenantal contract with Jehovah God, their God, Asher Jehovah Elakam, which means your God, your holy God, the, the unspoken name per se, the very holy name of God, that is our God, and we represent the image of God to the rest of the people on the planet. But they're seeing all these dichotomy of changes in our life and they're wondering, where is the God of Israel? And this is what Moshe's argument was. If you destroy all the people of Israel, what will the Egyptians say? What will the Amalekites say? What will the Philistines say about this? You know, why, where is the witness here? That God brought his people out in the desert to, only to destroy them. Well, you know, Jehovah is more loving and, and kind to us. Kazdova Elam Vayed, his kindness is everlasting. The 13 attributes of God, more than we can ever imagine. God is not a man. He's not a son of man. He does not think like a man. Thank God for that. So moving forward, um, however, one time will come when God will have a change of heart regarding his people. Uh, this is not like a human change of heart. It's a little bit different. It's a different viewpoint that God chooses in his, in his time and space continuum, per se. Because God does not exist necessarily in our time span, right? So at this point, he, he will uh, ask them to note that all of the gods which they have patronized, you know, statues, idols, uh, unauthorized, uh, high places, they're throughout Israel today. And, you know, to the dismay of God, you know, um, all, all these people patronizing these false idols like Baal worship and things of this nature, Northern Israel was dominated by that in, in, the, in the time of, of King Akaz, um, for example. And uh, the prophet uh, Eliyahu uh, talked about that, you know, when he went to Mount Carmel and uh, the great miracle there and defeating the false prophets of Baal. Don't want to get it into a rabbit hole here. I'm just trying to give you some pictures and imagery and examples so this would be more meaningful to you. I'm not standing here just talking to you. And this is what's interesting. Um, Yahshua had told the Jewish people, not only do you learn this song and learn it well and sing among yourself, when you wash dishes or when you uh, uh, groom the, the, uh, the lamb and take the fleece off or whatever, you're singing the song to yourself, humming it or whatever, but you teach it to your children as well. Don't ever forget that God was there for you in the beginning. He will be there for you to the end. He will always preserve a remnant. When we say all, all mine. So in the sixth Aliyah, God will turn his wrath against Israel's oppressors. So this is something that Christians uh, do not understand. And a lot of people, even secular Jews do not understand this very much. They think that God... Um, controls the will of the Gentile nation, so like the Roman Empire would crucify Jews, right, and take over the land, and burn down the temple, and destroy the, uh, Jerusalem, and raise it to the ground. Uh, the same thing can be said about the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, Assyrian Empire, the Canaanite nations of, uh, of old, and all these things. It seems like 
God is using these as chess pieces and telling and manipulating all these people's minds and heart to go and attack Israel. On the contrary, this is what's happening in reality. Their predisposition is to be jealous of the Jewish people for various reasons. Some of them, you know, all to their own and own rationalization of that. There's a lot of anti-Semite uh, attitudes toward the Jewish people today. But some people just have a systemic hatred for the Jewish people. Now, the adversary, or Hasidun per se, his main job as, as a Moloch of God is a prosecuting attorney of humanity. He will review, like, like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, these people are wretched by the same standard you hold for your servant Abraham. You know, <clears throat> judge them, judge them, the blind lady of justice. You know, people have the fundamental freedom of will. And if they, if they go to the UN today and demonize the Jewish people and say the Jewish people are a bunch of occupiers, invaders, uh, the poor Palestinian victims, and all the other propaganda you hear every day, every week, every month, every year uh, in the United Nations, which is one of the greatest evil organizations that's ever conceived next to the Third Right, in my opinion, you hear about all of this. It is there. What I'm saying is it does not take much to push these people a little bit in that direction to declare war against Israel, to invade Israel, and attempt to destroy Israel, divide its people, exile its people, imprison its people, murder its people, and take the land away. Look at the history of Israel, and we're just now recovering since 1948. The thing is, these nations had a free will of saying no to the evil in, uh, inclination of their ancestors, no to Hasatan for trying to seduce them to think about this and go and take the next step. I like to, and I'm getting ready to close, I like to think of the righteous king of Morocco. During the initial part of, <clears throat> of the Holocaust, there was a, there was a great, there's a general of the Hitler's armies. You can read this in volume one of Zohar, very famous story. And it's true. Uh, he brought his armies there into Morocco. There was a generational hundreds of years, 500 years of Jews there. Some of the oldest synagogues in the world in Morocco. And I have ancestry from that. Anyway, the king did not have much of a military. He couldn't stand up to the German military general when he demanded that he hand over all the, all the Jewish people. Unlike his counterpart in Italy, where the Vatican there, you know, Pope Pius um, the, uh, five, six, the eighth per se, okay, turned a blind eye to the Jewish people and let the Jews be rounded up and taken out of Italy and taken to the death camp. The king of Morocco pretty much told the general to stick it where it doesn't shine he said no. Now, the adversary was persuading him and seeing if there's all that anti-Semitism there or not. Is there enough anti-Semitism I could work with to prosecute virtue? But it happened to be that this Muslim king believed more in the monotheistic cross, um, cross um, uh, trying to say, similarity in belief between Allah and and um, and God and the Jewish people and the Muslim people, he said, I will not hand over these righteous people. They have done nothing wrong. And he put his name on, he, he put his name on there, you know, and his back against the wall. He could have been assassinated. His whole nation could be overrun with Nazis. It saved the day for those Jews that didn't go to death camps. What I'm saying is, just because it looks like uh, everyone is just out of their mind and they're attacking Israel. You hear about the mullahs in Iran uh, writing Hebrew death to the Jews on their missiles, ICBMs and things of this nature, talking about nuclear holocaust and all this. They want, they've been wanting to do this uh, since the time of Malik. You know, this is just the evil of a Malik reconstituted in modern, in, in modern era. It just really is. These nations do not have to do any of this. They could work with the, the Abraham Accord. And I hear Saudi Arabia is walking away from that. Why? Because we have a president of the United States that's not doing the same thing that the president president did without getting political. Let you decide on this. But in wrapping up this Torah parashah, <clears throat> when, when uh, Moshe finished uh, composing this song, 
and finish documenting writing and Dogarim scroll there to be put in the safety deposit box of the Ark of the Testimony, Ark of the Covenant. There was a small notation there that Moshe um, and Joshua finished and wrapped up the song because I believe they were singing it together. You can see, you see uh, a lot of sometimes when you read the Torah and you have someone there directing their pronunciation sometimes at that. And uh, Hebrew language is meant to be sung anyway. There's a little wavering in a, in a Jewish voice when you speak Hebrew. Uh, that's just the way the language is. It's the way it's in intended to be sung, but especially this poetic portion with Jimmy's son. So you think about the, the, um, the choir director, the composer of the music, the orator or whatever, and speaking on a high place there to the Jewish people. When they finish this, God calls Moshe, it's time you come home to me. So he asked him to go up to Mount, Mount Nebo. Well, you remember his brother um, uh, died, uh, died in Mount Hor, I believe, if I'm, I'm correct, uh, uh, many months ago before that. So this is a private encounter between the divine creator and his servant, Moshe. This was his birthday, his 120th, 20th birthday, I believe. I don't know why I keep on forgetting his exact number. But I'm saying he lived a very long, righteous life. He didn't have any health issues. He didn't have a, uh, uh, a bad back or whatever, like I'm getting, you know. He wasn't overweight. He was a righteous man. And he was called home to the Mount Nebo, where the final chapter of life would end. And this is where this parashat ends. And we can read about the rest of the story and the closeout of Dabarim to re began the Torah cycle all over again to Bereshit. So God tells Moshe, go up to the mountain, and from there I will show you all the Eretz Israel, all the land of Canaan, but you cannot go there. And he reminded him again, after, even after he admonished Moshe several times, do not ask me about this again. But the last, the last time, the last breath of Moshe, he was reminded them, you embarrassed the name of God, not privately, that wasn't the great sin. It was among the people of Israel saw the behavior of Moshe, losing his temper, taking the name of God in vain through a an, 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 uh, negative, angry episode. That was the sin that he was talking about. So I hope everyone enjoyed this parashah. Not too long. I tried not to be too long-winded. Try to give you some various use cases and connection points in your life between the past and the present. I hope it's meaningful to you. I mean, I hope you're raising your children the way that Moshe said to raise, raise the children of Israel 3,500 years ago. What good is it go, going to Jewish education, going to, to a cheder? These Jewish schools are very expensive. Going to yeshiva and things of that nature. If your message is inconsistent with the message of the rabbis teaching in, in yeshiva and the Jewish educational system, what good is it? If they don't see the book of Psalms and the mother has a book of Psalms there and she reads it every night and the children hear her saying her Shema every evening and, say, and, and reading her, her, her book, of, a book of prayers, you know, to heal in Psalm, if the children do not see that and the mother is saying, you need to do this, daughter, um, son, you need to read the Torah with your father, but the father is not opening the Torah. The father's doing something else. The father's unavailable to his children. This is what I'm talking about. There's something miraculous and special about the words of Jehovah God. That it, it's beyond our human imagination. Uh, the Hebrew language makes it very pure. It's translated into other language English and it loses, uses that divine intent like kissing Jehovah to a blanket, and who wants to do that? When you kiss your mother, you want to kiss her on your cheek, you want to hug her, you want to love her, you want to have an intimate relationship. This is what Jehovah wants of us. I encourage you to teach your children right from wrong. Even in America, teach them what they, our founding fathers had to do to be able to fight the, um, you know, say, say uh, United Kingdom, the Great Britain, and be able to found our nation on a Judeo-Christian kind of framework of justice system. Incidentally, that's why we have the Ten Commandments um, mounted in the Supreme Court uh, to this day, because it's a symbol of our tart of our legal system today. 
Uh, we would not be an independent nation today. We would be part of the Third Reich if we did not focus on these kind of things and teach our children. Even if you're not Jewish and you're teaching your children about the Jewish people, we, a son or daughter, you are to love the Jewish people. You are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It was horrible what happened in the Holocaust. It was, happen, it was horrible what happened in the Great Crusade. It was horrible in the great exile of Jews in 1492. And in the 1600s, when no Jew could be found anywhere in England, these were horrible events. The church had failed miserably at this. The popes had miserably failed. We should be ashamed of ourselves. The Jews didn't deserve this. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about It's your life witness. What kind of song are you singing to your children? Is it a song of happiness, a song of joy? Are you, are you observing all the full array of their behavior, both good and bad? Are you a permissive parent? Or do you let a child to, to just run wild in your home and decide whatever they want to for their life, for right and wrong? Or do you put limits and boundaries at the same time when you admonish them, give them nurturing love? This is how Jehovah wants to have a relationship with us. And if I can give any wisdom at all at 58 years old, that's what I would like to say. Well, this is Reb Yara Benim at signing out to another edition of the Torah Watchman Show. We share the knowledge and wealth and love and truth to everyone who's willing to hear it. You be that living truth. Be a Torah builder, not a Torah, Torah destroyer like, I, like other people. I'm a lighthouse on the hill that will not be hid. I am not politically correct. I will shoot from the hip every time. I'm the black and white truth. You know, and um, I, I am welcome to be hated for being a, a trooper. You know, the world is, is round and not flat. Thank you again for attending this video. Please um, click like and notify and subscribe and tell your friends that this Cardi Jew here loves you with all his heart. Whether you're Jew or gentle or no hot or indifferent, I love you all because you're all created in a beautiful, sweet mwah, image of Jehovah God. You are, you are, and you're beautiful and you're created for greatness. That's all I want to say. Shalom Aleichem and good night. Take care of yourself. Good Shabbos. And if I don't see you again, uh, uh, you know, may your name be written in the book of life and may you have an easy fast for your Yom Kippurim coming up very soon. Take care.